Happy 2019, China Watchers, and welcome to another episode of Silk Celluloid, your thread to the Middle Kingdom. I'm your host, Ryan Carroll. Um, it is January 1st, so Happy New Year to all of our SilkCelluloid.com China Watchers. Now, we had not planned on doing a special holiday episode. Um, as a matter of fact, we're in the process of researching our next episode that should be up in the coming days. Now, this episode's actually an episode that's bumped our previous planned podcast that would focus on the year-end box office results in China, um, which it itself will be coming uh, soon as well. That one has a little more research that we want to put into it before we uh, we record it and get it out. Um, now, this, this podcast today is one that's just off the cup. Um, it is obviously bumping an episode that it itself has bumped uh, our next planned uh, podcast dis discussions. And uh, the reason for all of this is that I went and watched Aquaman today at the movie theaters. I went there just because I wanted to see what all the hubbub was about uh, with its dominance at the China box office to see if there was anything specific that was really propelling it forward. Um, and the movie is now projected to make a little over under $280 million in its final total in China. Um, overtaking the astonish, astonishing 270 million U.S. dollars uh, for the final total of Sony's Venom, and the last time I checked, uh, just last night, Aquaman had just crossed 270 million, so it basically is dead even with Venom. But probably by the time you're listening to this podcast, or even by the time I get it up, um, it is going to actually have overtaken. Venom's final box office. Now, uh, much has been said about the marketing in reaction to Aquaman's success being centered around it being sold not just as a superhero flick, but as a fantasy film as well, a genre that is hugely popular in China and that one we have an article about over on SilkCelluloid.com. Uh, the article is discussing Hollywood's and many trade pundits' misconception of China's love for sci-fi with China's love for fantasy. Now, this was obviously in the film. Um, the fantasy aspects of Aquaman, you know, it really does stand out, um, especially if you're kind of looking at the visuals, the, the, the visuals of the sweeping shots of the city of Atlantis itself as the characters enter into the city. And one thing that really stood out to me uh, immediately was the choice of color palette and the design choices. And this actually re reminded me of some recent Chinese fantasy and sci-fi films. Now, I don't know if this is just a, a happy coincidence or if these choices were intentional, uh, since James Wan is uh, Chinese Malaysian, but I am leaning more on the side of coincidence than uh, it being something specifically uh, decided as they were going through the concepts and the design of what the city is going to look like, you know, in trying to reach a broader audience in China. Um, I think it probably has more of, a, of an influence from something like Avatar than it does from Chinese films, but I have been wrong before, and I might be wrong today. We'll, we'll probably have to wait and see for the audio commentary on the Blu-ray release. <clears throat> Now, the fantasy elements, you know, kind of this little fantasy subgenre mixed in with the superhero film. Um, I am an advocate saying that superhero films are a genre themselves, but I don't think that the fantasy aspects in the marketing and in the film itself is really what has propelled this movie forward in the way it has. Um, and I think there is a blatantly overlooked genre that the movie follows that is not only huge in China, but it has been big for several years. And this is the, the treasure hunting adventure film uh, kind of along the lines of the 80s, you know, kind of adventure films romancing the, romancing, romancing the stone and the Indiana Jones movies. And James Wan actually specified that these films uh, were a direct influence on how he made this kind of subplot within Aquaman. There's a certain arc 
in Aquaman in the middle section that kind of involves this Indiana Jones uh, treasure hunting adventure film. Now, like I said before, I don't know if this is just happenstance that Aquaman happened to kind of tap into another subgenre within the superhero film itself that resonated with Chinese moviegoers. And I said that this kind of uh, subgenre, this genre has been incredibly popular in China, uh, but it's it's not necessarily kind of, uh, you know, kind of said to be a treasure hunting or Indiana, jo Indiana Jones style film. Um, in China, they're typically referred to as tomb raiding films. And these tomb raiding films is probably best represented by the, uh, the hit uh, Mojin, The Lost Legend, uh, which is coincidentally the only December released film that Aquaman did not break its opening weekend record for the whole month of December. So Aquaman's uh, phenomenal, uh, I believe it was 93 million opening weekend, makes it the second biggest opening weekend for the month of December in China, and that's behind Mojin, The Lost Legend, which came out a few years back. And uh, probably with uh, inflation adjustments, uh, Mojin is still tracking ahead of Aquaman by quite a few million. And I say this because at one time, Mojin, uh, which is based off a popular e-published light novel in China, we're going to be talking about uh, light novels and e-publishing and the whole ACGN, the whole anime, comics, games, light novel, uh, you know, market and industry in China at a later date. This is a big, uh, a big area of focus for silkcelluloid.com, but we're not really going to get into it today. And like I said, Mojin, uh, a popular uh, serialized e-published light novel, was at one time one of the top 10 movies of all time in China. And it's not the only tomb raiding film that has reached box office success in China, as there are other films in this subgenre, such as Time Raiders, and the Jackie Chan starring Kung Fu Yoga, which was a uh, co-production with India. Part of the film is shot over in there. And both of these are tomb raiding films, uh, tomb raiding this kind of Indiana Jones treasure hunting adventure films. And both Time Raiders and Kung Fu Yoga, um, they both were in the top 20 grossing domestic films in China at their time. Of course, they are no longer in the top 20. But they're most likely still in the top uh, top 100, if not the top 50. I really haven't gone through um, the uh, the box office, uh, the top films in quite a while, so I don't want to actually specify. Now, um, getting back to Aquaman, Aquaman is not the first tomb raiding, treasure hunting, Indiana Jones inspired film to find success in China. Uh, Tom Cruise's poorly conceived The Mummy which I was really looking forward to the Dark Universe, and then I watched The Mummy, and I'm glad it does not exist anymore. Um, the Mummy actually opened $17 million more in China in its opening weekend than it did in North America, than it did here in the States and in Canada. And they contribute that to that tomb raiding style, you know, kind of... Uh, aspect to it, especially when they're going into the, the tomb and they're, they're pulling out the mummy, the mummy sarcophagi. And another major film that has kind of benefited from this is the Tomb Raider reboot with uh, Alicia Vikander. And this didn't have a huge opening weekend. The final numbers were not like phenomenal. It's not something you're going to write your mother about. Uh, but one thing that really stands out about Tomb Raider, about this reboot last year or this year, might be this year, um, is that from its opening weekend to its second weekend, it only saw a 32% drop weekend on weekend. And China is a country where Hollywood tent pole, film, tent, tent pole films, sorry about that, I told you this is off the cuff. Um, this is a country where these, these big Hollywood blockbusters Actually, it's common for them to see an 80, 85 percent drop weekend on weekend. That is not unusual at all. A lot of people made uh, a big hubbub about the Star Wars movies having like a 95 percent drop off, 90 percent drop off. Um, 
And I, I honestly wasn't that surprised about it, but I was a little surprised. I think Star Wars has a long ways to go. I think it has a, a whole other generation that is going to be growing up with these films coming out before it really starts to kind of take hold, if it ever does. Um, and with Disney Plus coming out and the streaming uh, series of Star Wars, that might actually help kind of motivate its kind of a fan base in China, but it's it's all up to be seen. And it's a little off topic for right now. I'm sorry about that. Uh, but all of these elements, these fantasy elements, the tomb raiding, you know, kind of Indiana Jones, treasure hunting elements, plus the official backing of the China Film Group, which released the film. The China Film Group obviously releases all uh, Hollywood movies in, in, in China, uh, but they actually... Uh, were officially backing the film. They were the ones who decided to release Aquaman two weeks early in China. And their decision to release it early, their official backing, these kind of sub-genre elements that are mixed in within the superhero genre, you know, fantasy, tomb raiding, um, these all help put Aquaman over the top with Chinese audiences. And I would, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm really excited to see if Aquaman actually uh, breaks 280 million in its final tally in China. Now, uh, I'm going to wrap this up um, here at SilkCelluloid.com. Uh, do check out our website. Check out the articles that we reference. Uh, this was an off-the-cuff, unexpected podcast, but I just kind of felt after watching the movie that I really needed to uh, to get this out there. And honestly, I didn't want to write an entire post about it on New Year's Day. <laughs> um, so stay tuned, China watchers. I'm your host, Ryan Carroll. I will see you next time.